Hey everyone, Kona here. We don't have a regular episode this week for a lot of reasons, mainly because I haven't finished writing it. Um, it's, you know, it's been a rough one, but what we are doing instead is releasing an episode that we did for Patreon a while back on Richard Hoagland. Now, a normal thought to be having right now was, didn't you just do that last week? What is happening? Yeah, no, we did not. We did the case of Robert Hoagland. Robert Hoagland, uh, if you remember, was the Newtown, Connecticut man who disappeared in 2003. and was just found to have been living in New York State about 90 miles away from his home under an assumed name. He was unfortunately found deceased, which is how this whole story broke, which we mention in our follow-up episode that came out last week. But he is not Richard Hoagland. Richard Hoagland is an Indiana man who in 1993 also disappeared. His story didn't get resolved until over 20 years later. We did this episode even though it is not an unsolved missing persons case, which is what our podcast is about. But when I was researching the Robert Hoagland case initially, I kept on running into comments saying like, oh, he was found. And even after we released our initial episode in 2021, we would get the same comments. They're like, this case has been solved. Like, what are, why are you doing an episode on this? Because people kept on mistaking Robert Hoagland for Richard Hoagland. What I find so interesting is that I use the Richard Hoagland story as to me, like more mental proof as to um, why Robert Hoagland didn't just walk out of his life. Because there are a lot of differences in the circumstances between the two disappearances. And to me, that meant that something else had happened to Robert Hoagland. Well, guess what, guys? I was clearly wrong because, you know, it turns out that Robert did walk out on his life. Now, I also, getting back to Robert real quick, do want to say, you know, unfortunately, we haven't had a lot more information come out since I recorded that follow-up episode last week. I really thought we would be hearing more from people in the Rock Hill area, but um, it hasn't really happened. A few people were interviewed and were like, yeah, we don't know that guy. Like, you know, I've never seen him we don't know him. I The roommate hasn't come out to speak. The only really new information that I've read um, are reports that he did die of cardiac arrest. So don't know if the Hoagland family is going to speak. Chris, the son, did speak briefly to a reporter and just, you know, said that they're all very shocked and confused right now, which, yeah, I'm sure they are, you know, and our th- thoughts are absolutely with them. So I don't know where that is. But... In the meantime, please enjoy this episode dealing with the mysterious disappearance and reappearance of Richard Hoagland. Richard Hoagland was a successful family man who lived with his wife and two sons in a suburb outside of Indianapolis, Indiana. On February 10th, 1993, he called his wife from work and told her he was sick and heading to the emergency room. He never came home again. For over 23 years, his wife Linda and their two sons wondered about his fate. But in 2016, a bizarre story emerged that proved Richard Hoagland wasn't who they or anyone else thought he was. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Richard Hoagland. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. 
this case that I'm bringing you today is Richard Hoagland. And I know some of you listening might be confused because you're like, but you did this one already. Right. Hoagie. Right. Right. But that is Robert Hoagland. Uh Yeah. Okay. Now, ever since we put that episode out, which was the beginning of season two, we have received a bunch of comments on social media saying that he had been found. Oh, Um, But he has not. Robert Hoagie Hoagland is still missing. But there was another married middle-aged father who had gone missing and was eventually found. But this man was Richard Hoagland. Weird. Yeah. Not from the same area, right? No. uh -uh, Indiana and Connecticut. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. That would be really weird. I know, right? If they're like both from Connecticut or whatever. Richard Hoagland is the solved missing persons case that we're going to be talking about today. Spoiler alert. I mean, I just said right before that, that he had been found. I know that, but. <laughs> I was, so I was saying it's solved. <laughs> A spoiler alert. I don't know, because this is supposed to be unsolved missing. Well, that's cases. why this is a Patreon bonus and not a regular episode. And besides, my dad, uh, he he was a listener. I don't know that he listens anymore because no. uh, I think it just bums him out too much. <laughs> and so he suggested that at the end of our regular episodes, we do a segment that he thinks we should call Lost and Found, where we highlight a missing person story with a happy ending. Okay. <laughs> Which, like, I don't dislike the idea. The problem I have with that is that... um what I have seen is that when a lot of times, and I'm not talking about like the huge cases like Elizabeth Smart or, you know, where they're gone for years and years and years. I'm talking like you're more run of the mill, they're missing and then they're found in a day, a week, you know, whatever. Right. A lot of times after that, like they really don't want their name out there anymore. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, like if they're an adult, they don't want their own name out of there. And if it's a minor, the family doesn't want their name out there anymore. Well, yeah. And, you know, that could be, you know, triggering some sort of trauma depending on what they went through while they were missing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that, so that's the only reason I'm kind of like a little like, uh, I don't know about that. But Plus it would also turn our episodes into like two hours. <laughs> very true. Very true. Um, let's get to the story of Richard Hoagland. Richard Hoagland and Linda Eisler married in 1982. It was Richard's second marriage and Linda's first. Children followed soon after, two boys named Matthew and Doug. Richard Hoagland worked in insurance and was able to afford his family an upper-middle-class lifestyle. They owned a large home outside of Indianapolis and had a speedboat that they would take out on the lake. They went on lavish vacations, and Richard owned a closet full of expensive suits. They were living the American dream. But that all began to change in 1993. Linda noticed that Richard was beginning to act strangely. Her husband, who was usually spontaneous and fun, was now acting distant and withdrawn. She feared that he was sinking into depression. Her fears only grew when on February 10th, 1993, she received a bizarre phone call from her husband. Richard, who was at work, called her and told her that he was sick. Sick enough that he thought he had to go to the emergency room. Oh, no. Yeah. So, like, very bad. Um, And Linda, of course, you know, being a good wife, said that she would go with him because, you know, you don't want to just have your husband going to the emergency room alone. But he said that he couldn't wait and that he was going to go now. About 40 minutes after this phone call, Linda left to go pick up their son, Doug, who was six at the time from daycare. When she got home, their older son, Matthew, who was nine, was home alone. Now, this was in 1993 before most people had cell phones and Linda was worried about her husband. So like he was supposed to have been home with their son, Matthew. And so obviously it sounds like he's at the hospital. She's worried, you know. Well, sure. But I mean, any emergency room visit is going to be a lot longer than 45 minutes. Exactly. Exactly. Even if there's like nothing wrong with you. Do we know, did he say anything about what symptoms he had or anything like that to his wife? Not that I saw, just that he was very sick. Okay. I'm sure he did because it would be sure. really insane if he didn't. I'm but you definitely know. going to call you the next time I feel sick and just say, I feel sick. I feel sick. I'm going to the ER. <laughs> and not no tell further you anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no further information available. <laughs> 
But yeah, it was not in the articles that I read. I, I think, you know, by the time a lot of this was written about, uh, nobody really cared. <laughs> Fair point. But of course, at the time, she's worried because, yeah. you know, she hadn't heard from him. He wasn't home. Like, she and didn't know what was going on. And now she's got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old who, I mean, I... I guess you could leave the nine-year-old in charge of the six-year-old, but that's kind of pushing it. Yeah, it was the early 90s, so like maybe, uh, that's but true. you yeah. know, but yeah, you're right. It is a little, it, it is pushing it. So she, of course, called the hospital, but he wasn't there. So, you know, that was like the closest hospital that she called. So she called a different hospital, but no Richard. He hadn't checked in at any hospital in the area. Linda was growing more confused and more concerned by the minute, but then Richard called. Did he say where he was? Well, not exactly. When he called that evening, he said the words that would change the course of Linda's life. Quote, I can't live this way anymore. I feel you would be better off without me. End quote. That's not good. No. And that is all he said before hanging up. So no time for follow-up questions. No, like, what do you mean by that? No, you know, I we won't be better without you. Like, what are you planning? You know, she must have been absolutely terrified, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, th th does that mean, I'm sure it's running through her head. Does that mean, is he divorcing me? Is he suicidal? Exactly. I mean, it know. could be any number of things, none of which are good. Right, yeah. So she was frantic, you know, I'm sure running through every single possibility in her head, you know, while still trying to take care of their two kids who, of course, they're kids. So they're like, OK, well, when's dinner, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But then he called back and said something even more bizarre. Quote, I don't want to go to jail. I'm never coming back. End quote. That, all right. Yeah. So again, he hung up before Linda was able to ask any follow up questions like jail. Yeah. Like Big who's going to jail? There. Like, what are you talking about? Because to her knowledge, Richard like wasn't in any trouble. He wasn't a lawbreaker. You know, there was no reason that she was aware of that this would even be a concern for him. And you said he sold insurance? Yeah. Hmm. Like, from all accounts, he's like a standard family man, nine to five type of dude, like no, you know, vices that she's aware of, like nothing, you know, she could not figure out what any of this was about. Like, all of it came out of the blue. You know, he left for work that morning and she thought everything was normal. So after he called, you know, she didn't know what to do. So she started looking around the house to see if she could, like, find any answers to whatever the hell was happening. All of Richard's things were still there. His clothes, his passport, his toothbrush. You know, he, of course, had his wallet with him, obviously. But it was February in Indianapolis, which is terrible weather, and his winter coat was still there, which honestly is weird because it seems strange to me that he wouldn't have just taken that to work that morning, you know? Right, yeah. Whether he was planning this or not. Exactly. Yeah. Regardless, like you would think that you would take your winter coat to work with you. So when he didn't return home, Linda reported him missing. I don't know a lot about, you know, how police immediately reacted. I'm sure that they didn't like hop to it that night, but it does sound like they started an investigation relatively quickly, like they might have made her wait that stereotypical 48 hours. I'm not exactly sure. But a few days later, they were actively looking and they found his car. Richard's car was found abandoned at the Indianapolis International Airport. Uh oh. Yeah. So, of course, you know, they're thinking like, oh, he like took off. Right. But his name wasn't listed on any flights that had gone out. Hmm. However, keep in mind, this is pre 9-11. Right. And while you did still have to like show ID to get on a plane, it was a lot easier to get on a flight. You know, there were way fewer checks. Like, I think that if, you know, maybe if you had like a fake ID or something along those lines, you would have a much better chance of getting on a plane in 1993 than you would now. Sure. But you also have to think that he had to have used a credit card to purchase the ticket. No, because you could do it in cash then. 
Well, sh- yeah, I mean, I understand that, but like, it seems kind of weird if he had like a couple hundred bucks just in his wallet. I don't know. I mean, he could have gone to the ATM. Or if he was planning this, you know, he could have been squirreling cash away. Yeah, that's true. Linda doesn't know what to make of this, though. You know, like I said, they they found his car at the airport. They think maybe he took a flight, but, you know, without his name on any passenger lists, they have no clue as to, one, if he did, or two, where he could have gone. Right. But then, later that month, Linda heard from Richard. He called her collect a few times, but offered little in the way of explanation. Linda was able to trace the calls, and they came from Aruba and Venezuela. Oh, no extradition in Venezuela. Oh, is that true? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So if he did commit some crime that he thought he was going to get arrested for, he's they're not going to they're not going to be able to extradite him from Venezuela. Yeah, well, I find it amazing that he made it to Aruba and he didn't have his passport with him. So Oh, right. He, he must have like had some sort of fake passport or something because he would have had to take a plane. You know, you can't drive down to Aruba like it's an island. Yeah. So I find it really interesting that he was able to get there and then from there, presumably to Venezuela. I don't know if he made stops in between, but either way, like that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even I I don't think Aruba was like one of those countries that you could get into with just a uh, a birth certificate like Canada and oh, Mexico yeah, yeah, yeah. were back then but um but even if Aruba was Venezuela, Venezuela wouldn't was yeah not. yeah exactly so i don't know but yeah i mean really he ended up a lot further away than i think anybody expected so Linda still even though he had been in touch and she knew he was at least alive like she had no idea what was actually going on or what prompted any of this But her life was falling apart. You know, not only did she lose the husband and the father of her children, but Richard was the breadwinner. And he just split, leaving her with no money or backup plan, just a bunch of maxed out credit cards. To make matters worse, police were beginning to think that there was more to the story. They started suspecting Richard of being involved in illegal business dealings. What's more is they thought Linda was in on it as well. I wonder why they would think that. Well, their theory was that Richard had left to set up a new life and that Linda and the boys would be following him. I mean, if that was the case, it would be odd for her to report him missing. Well, maybe, you know, it was a situation where, like, she was doing that to throw suspicion off of herself right you know she played the role of this confused wife who didn't know what had happened then nobody would suspect that she was involved in these illegal business dealings it seems kind of elaborate though you know yeah especially considering like up to this point it didn't seem like any law enforcement was investigating him so like if, if he was planning on picking up and starting a new life somewhere and then bring the wife and kids over just go and do it. Right. And don't talk about it and just like quietly just split. disappear. Yeah. 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 Like the whole family. Well, exactly. Yeah. Linda told ABC News, quote, they interrogated me over and over. They alluded a lot to the possibility that he was involved in some type of drug trafficking, which I had no clue. End quote. Though Linda had nothing to do with her husband's disappearance or any illegal dealings, whatever they were, she did begin to think that the police may have been onto something regarding her husband because strange things started happening. Linda noticed that she was being followed around town. When she received her mail, much of it looked like it had already been opened and resealed. And her father even found a listening device on her phone. Interesting. Yeah. So something was going on, but she had no idea what. Eventually, the financial mess that Richard left became too much for Linda, and she lost their house and their car. She and her boys moved in with her parents to save money, but Linda still felt like she was being watched. 
This feeling didn't go away, and six months later, she took her children and moved to another town in Indiana and basically went into hiding. She put all of her bills in her parents' name and would make her kids catch the school bus from a friend's house so that nobody knew where they lived. And this paranoia lasted four years. And when I say paranoia, I'm not saying that it's unjustified because, again, like, her dad found a listening device on her phone. Yeah, no. You know? Yeah. I don't know if whatever was going on continued for all of those years or or whatever, but she definitely had a reason to be paranoid. Yeah, it's worth the 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 caution. Yeah. So after the collect calls in February of 1993, Linda didn't hear from Richard again. The next contact, though, came later that year via birthday cards to Matthew and Doug, each of which had $50 inside. Any return address or stamps from another country? No, no. And yeah, I I, I don't remember and I don't have it in here um, specifically where it was postmarked from, but I know that it was just kind of a dead end wherever it was. The card that he sent to Doug for his seventh birthday read, quote, have a super birthday. You are a super boy. I love you and miss seeing you. Let your mom help spend this money. You might want to put some away. Maybe sometime soon we will get to see each other. I bet I won't even know you. It has been so long. Mind your mother. Bye, dad. End quote. (laughs) Like, what a fucked up birthday card to send your seven-year-old son after you abandoned your family like you know eight months prior or whatever i'm sure it came up in therapy (sighs) yeah yeah but after those cards richard never tried to contact his family again no more cards no more phone calls nothing As the years went on, Linda started to rebuild her life. She divorced Richard in absentia after finding out that right before he left, he maxed out a total of 26 credit cards. Whoa. Yeah. And even forged Linda's signature on a loan. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, the judge ordered Richard to pay the debts, but, you know, he obviously wasn't around to do so. But yeah, it's meaningless, but cool. Great. Well, no, it's not meaningless because, I mean, because they were married, they were her debts as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was a really important judgment right, in right. terms of, like, Linda being able to live a functional life. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I wasn't thinking about it like that, but you're right. Yeah. In 2003, 10 years after he went missing, Richard Hoagland was officially declared dead by the state of Indiana. Linda eventually remarried and worked as a nurse. Matthew grew up and started his own family. Doug, the one who was younger, who got that birthday card, had a much rougher go of it. He says now that his issues weren't related to his father's disappearance, but his mother disagrees. I mean, they might have been related to the birthday card. Yeah, yeah, like specifically, just that fucking birthday card. She believes that the toll that, you know, Richard's whole abandonment took on her family was immense, which of course it was. Like, how could it not be? Yeah. When Doug was in high school, he broke his hand. The doctors prescribed him pain medicine, and like and we know, then it, then it went downhill from there. It did, you know, it, it, like it happens for so, so many people. So that led to a drug problem that has plagued him ever since. He has spent most of his adult life in jail and prison for various just drug related offenses. For 23 years, Linda and her two sons lived without answers. Until 2016, when she received a call from a detective in Pasco County, Florida. Detective Anthony Cardillo asked Linda if she knew a man named Richard Hoagland. She told him, yes, that was her ex-husband. He who, who is also dead. Yeah, also legally. officially legally dead. Yeah. And had been at this point for 13 years. But this detective told Linda that they had her husband in custody. Okay, so let's talk about what a piece of shit this guy is. Also a dumbass because he came back to the States and got arrested in Florida. Well, 23 years later, so apparently he was kind of good at it. And you will not believe when you hear what this guy's been up to for the past 23 years. All right, let's let's get into it. 
So apparently Richard bounced around Aruba, Venezuela, and who knows where else in 1993. But by 1994, he landed in Florida. He was in Florida that whole time? That whole time. Wow. Okay, I take it back. I guess he's not as much of a dumbass as I thought. Yeah. I mean, a piece of shit. Yeah. (laughs) For sure. But yeah. So he got to Florida and he rented a room from a man named Edward Szymanski. Edward was grieving the loss of his son, Terry, who had recently died in a fishing accident. Richard found Terry's death certificate and was able to use the information on it to request a birth certificate. Oh, that's yeah. fucked up. Yep. Now, with that, he was able to receive an Alabama driver's license through the mail. Through the mail. Through the mail, which is why I assume he did Alabama instead of Florida. Yeah. Now, once he had that Alabama driver's license, he was able to obtain a Florida driver's license. Gotcha. After that, Richard began living his life as Terry Szymanski. He even got married. As Terry Szymanski? As Terry Szymanski. Ugh. Yep. And within a few years, his new wife gave birth to a son. What the hell? Yeah, together they built a lovely life for themselves. They bought a home and investment properties that they rented out. Is that what he did for a living? Yeah, basically. Richard even received his pilot's license and had his own plane. What? Like, he was living the life while he left his first family in financial ruin, being, like, followed around and listened to and spied on and just, you know, living through hell for years. Richard was finally discovered by the real Terry Szymanski's nephew. In 2013, he was looking up his family on Ancestry.com and found Terry Szymanski's marriage certificate and pilot's license, both of which were issued after they had buried him in 1991. Hmm. According to an article on Medium written by Shabango Lakshmi, the Szymanski family was hesitant to do anything with this information. They didn't know who had stolen Terry's identity, and they didn't know if this would, like, put them in danger or or what, you know? They didn't know what they were looking at, what they were walking into, potentially right. yeah. nothing. But in 2016, so, like, three years later, the nephew said, you know what, screw it, and decided to contact the police anyway. When Detective Cardio confronted Richard, he swore that he was Terry Szymanski. He provided his social security number, driver's license, and birth certificate. Which all seemed legit. Well, yeah, because they were really, you know, they had been issued by the proper government agencies. You know, they weren't forgeries or anything like that. Right. They were just gotten under false pretenses. But then Cardillo showed Richard Terry's death certificate. And then Richard finally admitted who he really was. Hmm. Richard was arrested for identity theft, and Indiana authorities wanted to charge him with a lot more. Uh, Yeah, I'm sure. (laughs) Unfortunately, any other crimes, including theft for the money he took from Linda in order to start his new life, had statutes of limitations that had already run out. Wow. Yeah, so like the fraud, like all of that stuff. It had been 23 years, you know, and basically statute of limitations in the U.S., I mean, granted, it varies from state to state, but like pretty much beyond like murder, like 23 years, you can get away with a lot. Like most statutes of limitations are up by then. Well, yeah. I mean, especially white collar crime. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you're talking probably five to 10 years at most. Yeah. Yeah. So eventually, he ended up being sentenced to two years in federal prison for the identity theft. Mm. After his release in 2018, Linda sued Richard for back child support and was awarded $1.83 million. Did Richard have that? No, of course not. That hearing, though, was the first time that Richard's abandoned wife and children had seen him in person since 1993. Good God, I can't even imagine that. His younger son, Doug, told the Indianapolis Star, quote, 
If you think you had two kids and you wanted to see them so bad, you think you'd be a little bit emotional. But this guy, nothing. There is nothing there. End quote. Neither of the Hoagland children wants to have a relationship with the father who abandoned them. Mary, the woman he married in Florida, divorced him after his arrest and was able to keep most of their assets. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, because... I mean, she's an innocent party in this. Yeah, I mean, from all accounts, like, she had no idea. I mean, she thought she married Terry Szymanski, had no idea about, you know, anything that he had done in Indianapolis. So she was, from what I can tell, like, another innocent victim in all of this. It's unclear what Richard's relationship is with his youngest son, who was 19 at the time of his arrest, but Richard moved back to Indiana after he was released from prison. What? Yeah, like that part shocked me. It's like, dude, nobody wants you there. Like, just fucking leave. Yeah, just pick another state. Yeah, just like maybe Florida is done for you too, but like we have 48 more states or just go back to fucking Venezuela. Yeah. Like, just get out. Nobody wants you. But that's basically it. Richard, like, apparently has some sort of job and he's working to pay Linda back, you know, but, you know, he's not going to like he's not going to be able to pay back one point eight three million dollars. And he's probably working like the lowest like menial job that he can, you know, so that he doesn't have to. Right. But, yeah, he's just a shitty person who abandoned his family. We've covered many cases in which police have believed that a missing person just ran off to start a new life and this is one where it actually happened yeah yeah and there's still we still don't know like who the people were that were that was following no or or like never found on her phone any of that out or really what crimes he even actually committed, committed other than like you know like i said it does sound like he did he was squirreling away cash or something yeah um, you know, in order to make his escape. But yeah, I don't know if it was insurance okay. fraud right. or if he was involved in like illegal business dealings, if there was some sort of like crime element, or drugs, drugs, or something. gambling. Like we have no idea what this guy was actually into. Like nobody was really able to figure it out. Crazy. Yeah. And it is worth mentioning before, you know, you may start to think like, oh, well, maybe more people do run off and start new lives like unlike the other stories we've told where that's been a theory he did contact people after his disappearance right yeah the shitty birthday card the phone calls exactly multiple phone calls you know whatever so while yes some people do run off with no belongings you know no winter coat (laughs) to start a new life most of them are not richard hoagland thankfully Thank you for joining us for this very special Patreon bonus episode on uh, a solved missing persons case. (laughs) If you haven't left us a review, that would be great on the podcast app of your choice. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Good pods. um, Yeah, Apple, Apple, Spotify, Spotify, anything. Podbean, interestingly, is like our third highest source of listeners. So don't know what that's about. Never love it. it. No, yeah, they they also like it's another you know platform. But yeah, so Podbean, so iHeartRadio, we're everywhere. Um, And you know, tell your friends if you like it. Obviously, you do. You're on our Patreon, so thank you for that. But yeah, tell your friends. Again, we will have a normal episode next week, so stay tuned for that. And uh, in the meantime, we will see you here soon. See you soon. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it. <laughs>